join with me. Let's let's pray. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we acknowledge that you are the provider of everything we need. And because of that, we can confidently approach your throne tonight, regardless of what brought us into these rooms, regardless of what happened this week, this today, in the parking lot, we can come to you because you're not afraid of our sin. You're not afraid of our failures. And you simply say, as I've repeated before, hey, come here, sit in my lap. I've got some things I want to tell you. And so, Lord, that's why we're here tonight. Because we understand that you have some things that you want to tell us, not the group, us. And so as we consider your word, as we consider your examples in the Bible, Father, speak to our spirit about what in us needs to be exchanged. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Welcome. Uh, Exchange Life. There's maybe one or two new faces. Michael Perrin pastor of the Life Recovery Ministry, and that ministry is designed to help people recover the life that Christ intended. Yeah, there is an aspect of it in which addiction maybe falls into it, but it's more than that. It's, it's recovering the identity that we have as a child of God. We get involved in agreement with lies, we believe the lie, we then behave in accordance with the lie, and then our life looks like the lie, ultimately. The goal of exchange life is to, is to, turn it on, is to help you exchange agreement with lies for trust in the truth of God's word. That's why we're here. We're here to encourage you, to support you. We're not here to fix you, but we do want to remind you of who you are in Christ. And so that's the encouragement. Uh, these rooms are not going to, you're not going to find anybody telling you what you've done wrong you're going to be reminded of what you can do right. And that's the motivation. When I was in drugs, I didn't need somebody telling me that what I was doing was out of the will of God. I knew that. What I needed somebody to tell me and to demonstrate to me was, here is the will of God. Let's walk in this together. And so that's the partnership that we have in Exchange Life. There are four components. You're part of a corporate gathering right now. There are men's and women's groups that you're, you can go to after this session, after this corporate gathering, and you can discuss the topic at hand. Tonight we're going to be talking about exchanging emotion for truth. And so you, you can highlight something or maybe something registers in your spirit, and you can say, I, you know, I need to talk about that. And that's where the group comes in. If it's your first time, you're just going to stay put. You're just going to stay in this room. We've got a couple of leaders that will get to know you a little bit more. You can ask some questions. You can hear a little bit more about the process itself. The workbook with a first responder is a manual that helps you go deeper into the topics that we discuss on Monday nights. It's more of a, a deeper dive, and you are partnered up with somebody called the first responder, and that first responder walks with you through this. And then hopefully you'll come back and you'll want to be a first responder. So if you're here tonight and you haven't gone through the manual, granted, you may want to just kind of plant yourself for a couple of weeks before you figure everything out. Uh, if you're here tonight and you want to work with a first responder and maybe you've been here three, four times, um, I just want to see a show of hands. Anybody that wants to start working through it. Okay, we've got one and we've got one. Guys, gentlemen, is there anybody that is possible that could take somebody through it? Just lift your hand up. Nobody available right now. Johans is available right now. Okay, you kind of see who's available. All right, if, if that's for you. What's that? One on one. One on, I know, that was a divine appointment right there. Um, part of the reason why the, some of these guys didn't raise their hand is because they're working with two or three guys. So that's, you know, you reach a point of diminishing returns ultimately. Yeah. But we're going to talk about this tonight. Let's get after it. Here we go. Exchanging emotion for truth. Just on the front end, um, I may go. Wes is going to turn his phone to mute. And we'll, be, we'll be good to go. Shut it off. Or whatever. Shut it off. That's fine. Um, we're going to get started. Emotions. Without passion in life, life would be you know, pretty mundane, ultimately. I mean, if you had football players on the football field and they could kind of care less about the game, you probably wouldn't watch the football game very long. Basketball, same type of thing. Part of the reason why it's so appealing to us is because you have 
people who are passionate about life. They're emotional about a particular thing. Otherwise, life just becomes rote and it pretty much is loveless because there's no desire and no in our existence. No matter what you do in life, do it with passion. That's my encouragement to you. Do it full out. But emotions are an expression of the outside world of what's going on inside our heart, inside our internal garden. And emotions are morally neutral. However, when emotions are influenced by lies, emotions that are influenced by lies become the foundation of our behavior. Inevitably, what happens, we let emotion drive us to a place where we are no longer walking in our identity as a son or daughter of God. We are walking in an identity that who created? Everybody just point right at yourself. I created this identity based on how I, my emotions, how I feel, regardless of what the Word of God says, regardless of the promises of God, regardless of the encouragement of other people, I create my own destiny because of how I feel. It's important to understand that emotions, while true, are not always truth. They don't always match up with the truth of God. They may feel like truth. You might even believe they are true. But unless they align with the truth demonstrated in Scripture, demonstrated by the person and teaching of Jesus Christ, I have every reason to doubt their validity. Are you with me? I'm not saying that what you feel isn't what you're feeling. What I'm reminding us to do is step back away from it and try to determine who told me that. Where have I arrived at a place where I, I believe that X is appropriate when Jesus, uh, and you start questioning, and that's all I want to do is plant some seeds with you. Jesus felt emotion. I mean, anger, distrust, sorrow, compassion, frustration, agony. Agony to the point that he questioned the will of the Father. He even said it. He's like, look, if you can take this from, I'm paraphrasing here. If you can, if you can, t that was really bad. I'm sorry. I just, I had to use it. I haven't yeah. used it in a while, but it's okay. You, you'll forgive me later. Okay. He was, he was at the place of the deepest sorrow, so much so that he questioned whether or not the father was trustworthy. Maybe you've been here. Maybe you've experienced an emotion and you've questioned, are you even trustworthy? I mean, do you even see what's going on in my life? Do you understand how I feel right now, God? And what did Jesus do? He bowed the knee to the Father, and he trusted in the Father's trustworthiness despite what he felt in that moment. And that is truly where this whole thing begins. Emotions are an attribute of Christ. They're given to everybody, and we're supposed to steward those things, those gifts, those emotions accordingly. Like everything in our life, we're asked to steward. It either leads us into our destiny, or it leads us into disunion with the Father. Did you catch that? Yeah. Everything we have, everything that we have received, we have been asked to store that. We're not owners. We're not owners of what of everything that comes in our in our way in our way in our life. We are asked to steward that thing, and they will that stewardship. You'll either go to your destiny, or you'll go into disunion with the Father. It's all about union with the Father. It's not about discipline. It's about union. I'm the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me and I abide in you, you'll produce fruit. It's not about discipline, guys, ladies. It's about the union that we have with the Father. Why? Because he's trustworthy. Because he, as the song goes, you have proved yourself over and over and over again. And maybe he hasn't proved it in you, but that's why we have testimonies, amen? That's why we have people who share their story on occasion. Next week, we're going to have somebody share their testimony. And you can step into their testimony and claim that as yours. I mean, the spirit of Christ is the spirit of prophecy. And what we do is we prophesy to other people by sharing our story. And that establishes a legal precedent. And what that says to all of us is, look, if it happened to him, it can happen to me. If it happened to her, it can happen to me. And that's why it's important to share your testimony. God is responsible for fulfilling his promises, but he's not responsible for fulfilling your destiny. And how you manage your emotion plays a significant role in fulfilling of your destiny. Okay?
Living out of emotion hinders or hastens, ultimately, our ability to live it out. If we have created a reality based on how I feel, self is the orientation. Did you hear it? Reality is how I feel. I mean, it's in the, what I just said. I. How I feel. Self is the orientation. If we've created a reality based on union with Christ, he determines how I feel, quote unquote. He's the one that determines how I respond according to those feelings and those emotions. And we've hastened the way maker into our life. So why is that the case? Okay, y'all ready? We're going to get nerdy. Okay, hold on. We're going to go to the quantum level physics. All right, so hold, hold your horses. At the quantum level of everything, our thoughts influence the fabric of our existence, otherwise known as a thing that's called an observer effect. Okay? I think I've got it here. Boom. Look at that. It even worked. Okay? So here you have it, right? There's, there's the atom. You remember this from, I just gave somebody PTS right here by going to chemistry. But here's the atom. And in the center there, you've got the protons and the neutrons, and they kind of just rotate around each other. They really don't move very much. But on the outside, you have this thing called an electron, okay? And you see that, you know, it's electron, electron orbits, electron, and all this electrons all over. There's not three electrons, by the way. There's just one, as far as we know. And why do I say that? I say that because this thing called the observer effect, that electron that's kind of roaming around, when they try to look at that atom in, through a microscope, a very highly developed microscope, wherever that observer looks, that's where the electron's gonna be. And if it looks, some, if, the, if the observer looks somewhere else, that's where the electron's gonna be. It's called the observer effect. And what that says is this, when the observer views the atom, their influence their emotion, their thought determines where that electron positions itself. So if we expand that out into systems, hold on, if we expand that out into the systems of the world itself, it becomes evident that my bias, my thoughts, my emotion influence the reality I find myself in. You with me? Okay. What I give my attention to becomes what, what I will experience. Very true. So if you in, you know, encounter somebody and you have this thought that goes through your head, maybe you've got something coming up in the future, and this is the thought that you have, that's going to be really, really hard. Inevitably, what's going to happen to that thing? It's going to be really, really difficult for you. If you approach it which is with more of a, hey, I'm going to do my best, and I think this is going to be pretty easy, your spirit, your emotion is going to influence, the observer is going to influence that reality moving forward. And you're thinking to yourself, this sounds like a bunch of mumbo jumbo, hocus pocus science stuff. Well, you might, want to talk to, you might want to talk to Jesus because Jesus had something else to say about it. And here's what he said. I think I'm, I'm telling me he said it. Oh no, I gotta get rid of the background. Help. <laughs> Hold on. Hold on. Did that come up exchange life? No, nope, the background's still in there. Holding. Uh, it works. Guys. Sorry, gang. I think it worked. Come on in, guys. Come on. Come on in. You're good. Come sit with me. Hey. Glad to have you. Glad you came here, Hi. <laughs> I couldn't resist. That's all right. That's all right. 
You just walked in on uh, quantum physics, so I hope I'm not going to blow your mind here, but we're going to be okay. Um, in all of this, here's, here's what Jesus says. Don't you know that when you allow even a little lie into your heart, it can permeate the entire belief system? Yes. What's he saying? How you feel permeates the entire existence of who you are. So we might think it's mumbo jumbo hocus pocus. Oh, that's quantum physics and that, eh, that's too weird for me. Jesus had it in mind when he said this. A little leaven, Jesus says in another version of this verse, a little leaven works through the whole batch of dough. So as I think, as I feel, that determines the reality in which I will walk on a daily basis. My emotions have a lot more influence than I think we really want to give them credit for. When we expand it out, as I said before, into a system, it's evident that our bias, our emotions, how we feel, what we tell ourselves about reality and about situations really, really influences a lot of whether or not we are walking in the kingdom or we are walking in the city of Babylon. That's truly where we are. A little yeast works through the whole batch. Emotions create a bias, and that bias either limits us or it allows the Spirit of God and us to receive us to receive the kingdom of God and the truth that God has for all of us. Jesus says it like this, you know, to, for everyone who listens with an open heart will receive progressively more revelation. But those who don't listen with an open, teachable heart, even the understanding that they think they have will be taken from them. Although they listen carefully, they don't understand a thing, I say. They look and pretend to see, but the eyes of their hearts are closed. Do your, do you, does your heart have eyes? No. What he's really into, implying here is, as you see with your heart, which is the sentient part of your existence, which is the seat of belief and faith, which is also the seat of your emotion, that determines what you're able to see or not see. Have you ever met somebody that's so angry they literally cannot see? That's a physiological manifestation of what Jesus is talking about right here. He's like, you're, you're so blinded to those things because you have bias in your heart because your emotions have lied to you. And now what you want to do is you want to take that emotion and make it truth. And I'm telling you, it's not true. There's a greater truth, a higher truth for you. And that's why they can't see it. They've already predetermined their destiny by their bias of emotion or thought, if you will. And as mentioned, our thoughts form the bias within which we exist. That's, I mean, this, this takes it to a whole nother level when Jesus says, in, when the Holy Spirit says in the Bible, I should say, we are to take every thought captive in obedience to Christ. It takes it to a whole nother, what's he saying? If you don't take your thought cap, thoughts captive, there is somebody who will take your thought captive and it's not me. And you're going to walk out that thought as opposed to walking out what I say about you instead. It highlights the power associated with thinking on things such as what is noble, what is pure, what is truthful, what is lovely, what is honorable, what is of good report. All those things. Think about those things and see how it begins to change your destiny. It brings to weight the encouragement of meditating on the ways of God. Meditate, yes. Eastern mysticism has blown that thing up. We are to meditate. We are to sit and chew on the truth revealed in the scriptures. Because as we do that, our hearts transform so that we're able to see, unlike these folks that couldn't because their hearts were hardened. And this is the reason we are told to this. The Bible says it. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things of earth. Why? Because the things of earth are temporary, including, I'm going to put a little addendum, how you feel. It's temporary, gang. It may feel like this thing is going to go on for the rest of your life. I'm telling you right now, according to the word of God, it's temporary because it is of the earth. It is of the world. Okay? All right. We have to keep things in mind. Um, 
The Bible is full of examples with the power associated with our imagination, with our ability to consider the truth according to God as opposed to according to our emotions. I mean, Abraham saw a nation. Imagine a nation. Imagination. That's where we get the word imagination, by the way. Imagine a nation. That's where it is. Abraham saw it. Abraham was in the promised land, but he never set foot in the promised land. But he did see it. He wasn't limited by what he saw in his earthly environment. And he wasn't limited by how he felt. I'm not the guy. I'm too old. She can't even have kids. I mean, there was, there's a whole story to that. But ultimately, um, he tried to limit it. What did he base it on? His feelings. His feelings. God finally just said, come here. Sit in my lap. I've got something I want to show you. Look up in the sky. Everything you see in the sky, yeah, that's going to be the number of your children. Can you count it? No. Okay, good. Now, go chase your wife around the tent. Basically, that's what, that's what he said. That's, that's the Hebrew, all right? That's the literal interpretation of the Hebrew text. Abraham saw a family. Joshua collapsed Jericho. He saw it. How ridiculous do you think he felt? Hey, walk around seven, six times, and the seventh time, blow these trumpets. Can you imagine? How did you? How do you think he felt, especially as a leader? Hey, this is what we're going to do. You're not going to say a word. Everybody, shh. don't say a word. We're all just going to walk around. I can't imagine how that he felt in the midst of that, and yet he was obedient. Why? <clears throat> because God is trustworthy, and His word is trustworthy. Jesus observed the realm of heaven, and he altered basic math. What does five plus two equal? Seven. In the kingdom, what does five plus two equal? Whoever wants to Seven thousand. How did Jesus do that? He looked up in the realm of heaven and it altered reality here on earth. And guess what, gang? Each one of you is capable of doing that. Because you have the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead invading you in your mortal body, currently where you're sitting, if you're a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, you can begin calling down heaven's reality here on earth today. Not far distance, by and by, today. You come in and you, you're, an, you're an emotional wreck, but your emotions have got the better of you because sometimes your emotions are going to lie to you. Why do they lie to you? To keep control of you. Because they don't want you walking out of your destiny. They don't want you fulfilling the kingdom purpose that God has placed you here for. Mike Bickle says, if we do not understand that God is committed to first helping us grow in love, passion, we will be confused about his leadership in our life. God wants to grow each one of us. God wants to grow you. And God is leading us into a place of healing. And one of the greatest places of healing is in your emotions. It's how you feel about yourself primarily because what he says about you, it, one of these days, somebody is actually going to believe what this thing says about them. And they're going to change the world. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm right in there with you guys. I'm fighting every day. Oh, I got to believe this. I want to believe this. I want to believe this. And yeah, I get distracted along the way. You know, you take a seven-year-old and you throw it into the mix. Woo, that changes everything right away. Before nine o'clock in the morning, it changes everything right away. And I, it's interesting because we, just personal story, okay, ready? So we have a seven-year-old daughter. She was a beautiful gift to us by her mom. And mornings can be an adventure with Michaela. Um, her name is Michaela. So mornings are an adventure. So we have we have established certain times and certain things, certain alarms go off. You have to have this done by this time in the morning because we want to get to school, right? Uh, around the time we're supposed to be there. And so 7.35, the iPad goes off, and then you get dressed, and then you do whatever. So this morning it was 7.38, and the iPad's still on, and she's, she's still sitting there. And I know she knows what time it is because it says it right there in the corner. <laughs> and I came out, I said, what time is it? She goes, 7.38. And she goes right back to the iPad again. 
And I thought, oh, babe, we have a we have kind of an agreement here that it's going to go off at 7.35. Well, I didn't agree to that. <laughs> that was your agreement. She even like took it another step. That was you. You, you said that. I didn't say that. You, yeah. Ministry with Michaela is what I'm calling this. And so what do I do? By the what do I do? My emotions got the better of me. Now, did I yell or scream or throw something? Absolutely not. But something rose up in me. And as when that rose up in me, guess what happened to the atmosphere around me? It blew up. The whole thing blew up. And from that point forward, it was just go in and brush your teeth, put your shoes on, get your socks on, da 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 da, da. And you just start rattling these things off along the way. I had a conversation with my wife this afternoon, and I said, I said, the reason why it's like that is because of me. I'm the one that sets the tone, and I'm not doing a very good job. And I committed to her before God. I said, I am going to do my best to change this scenario tomorrow morning when we get up. Because I want to roll out with her knowing that she's loved and provided and cared for. She's not abandoned. She's ours. You know what I mean? So hold me accountable. Ask me next week how I'm doing. Michaela's, <laughs> we're going to call it Michaela's in the morning. Michaela in the morning. Okay, you ready? It's a sitcom. It could be a sitcom, honestly. So real quick, about another 10 minutes, all right? Hold on. I want to give you an example, a biblical example of how emotions thwart somebody's destiny in the scripture. Everything that we need for life and godliness is right here. And there's this guy named Saul. Okay, you may not know who it is. If you do, you maybe recall the story of who Saul was. He was the first king of Israel. And the nation of Israel entered the promised land, and things weren't going exactly the way that all the people thought they should go. And what they said to God was essentially this. Look, we want a king like these other <laughs> pagan nations that we see before us. But these other pagan nations that we see before us. And so they, they say, give us a king. God's like, you don't want a king. Yes, we do. No, in this back and forth banter. Here's what God says about a king. He's going to take their sons. He's going to take their daughters. He's going to appoint leaders that take their children into war. He'll take the best of their resources. He will take the male and female servants. And he's going to take at least 10% of everything that you own. And you know what the nation said? Sign us up. We're ready to go. They based it on how they felt the king. So God says, okay, uh, we'll go ahead and do it. And here's what it says in the Bible. It says, Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mizpah, and he said to the people of Israel, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I brought you up out of, excuse me, I brought you up Israel out of Egypt, and I delivered you from the hand of all the kingdoms that were oppressing you. But today you've rejected your God who saves you from all your calamities and your distresses, and you have said to him, set a king over us. Now therefore, present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. And Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel near, and the tribe of Benjamin was taken by Lot. He brought the tribe of Benjamin near <laughs> by its clans, and the clan of Matriites was taken by Lot. And Saul, the son of Kish, was taken by Lot. <laughs> But when they sought him, Saul, that is, he couldn't be found. How random is that, right? By the way, Saul was already anointed king earlier in the story, but he had he was hiding in the luggage. Like we find they found him hiding in the luggage. So get the picture, okay? Nation says we want a king. God says, yeah, you don't want a king. This is what they're going to do. Take your money, take your kids, go into war, all this other stuff. They say, no, we want a king. Samuel calls them together and he says, look, you've rejected God and you've said no to God. We want a king. Give us a king. And all this stuff happened. And Saul was chosen, but Saul was hiding in the luggage. He could not be found. It appears that Saul being taken by, by random happenstance was there. It wasn't. As I said, out of the guidance of the Holy Spirit, Samuel had already anointed him at, at Zuf, the king of Israel, he had said. How do we know that? Well, he took a journey. 
And this journey brought him, he was chasing after his dad's donkey. I tell you, you should read the Bible. There's some crazy <laughs> stuff in there, man. Yeah. So he goes on this journey to find the don this donkey. And along the way, he gets hit by the Spirit of God and he prophesies. So much so that people don't even know that it was Saul that was, like, we don't even know this dude. Okay, in addition to that, he was going up the hill and there were priests going up. And they were bringing bread and offerings to the Lord. And they gave some to Saul. I mean, the prophetic picture is pretty straightforward. Essentially, what God was saying is, look, the priest with the bread, I'm going to provide for you as king. I'm going to give you supernatural provision that you don't even have. Somebody needs to hear that tonight. He's going to give you supernatural provision of, that you don't even have in order to support you in the destiny that he has for you. Okay, Some of, there's a person here tonight that you need your school paid for, and if you will simply ask enough people and let them know what's going on, your school is gonna be paid for. Okay, that was free. So I hope somebody grabs that, because it's true. All right, so the whole idea with this is, God's gonna provide. In addition to that, God's also gonna prophetically provide the Spirit of God with Saul so that he can lead the, nation, lead the nation of Israel. So I think we all get the point. With all these declarations, with all this confirmation, with all these signs from God, with, with all this stuff that God is doing for Saul, he was still hiding. Why? Well, let's bring this thing home. You ready? Get to the point. With all the declarations, with all the promises, with all the provision, with all the miracles, with all the testimony that you have in your life, why are you hiding from what God wants you to do? I know I hate my preaching right there, but it needs to be said. It's because we limit ourselves by our emotions. <clears throat> First thing is this. We allow emotions to tell us lies that prevent us from embracing our destiny. Here's the first one. There's physical appearance. It says, it says in 1 Samuel that, that Saul was a head taller than all the other people. The implication is he was chosen because of his physical appearance. I look, I look the part. I don't look the part. I, I, you know, emotional lies about your physical appearance will limit your destiny. I, I don't look the right way. I, I don't like my hair. Uh, my nose doesn't fit on my face. I One ear is higher than the other. We do these things to ourselves. Tell me you don't, okay? But our physical appearance will limit our destiny if we agree with that lie emotionally in us. I'm not qualified because of my physical appearance. Note to self, who is the second king that God chose? David. What, is, what does it say about David? Yeah, God does not look on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. I think God learned his lesson with Saul, and he changed, he flipped the script, basically. And he went after a man who was after God's own heart. You with me? All right. What's that? He was good looking, though. He was, he was a ruddy, handsome man, yes. But he wasn't head, He wasn't adjacent. He wasn't head and shoulders above. Like a Saul, but David Here's another one. Emotional lies about your family of origin. Saul is from the tribe of Benjamin. Now that might not need, mean anything to you unless you kind of dig a little bit in the scripture. But it's said of the tribe of Benjamin that they were ravenous wolves. That was prophesied by Joshua, by the way. That you will be a tribe of ravenous wolves. How would you like that to be your family upbringing? I mean, literally, your family is known as a bunch of ravenous wolves that are out, literally out for blood and violence. That's how he was known. They were known for their anger. They were known for their perpetual violence. And the implication was Saul knew his qualifications and he felt that they disqualified him because he wasn't from some upstanding, upright, dressed to the nines tribe. He was from the guys that would go out and cut throats. That's what this tribe did. So his family of origin limited him. Maybe you think that, you know, I lack the education. Nobody in my life, has ever, nobody in our family has ever done this before. I grew up in a single parent home. My father was not a good man. Conversely, my father was a great man. 
I'm just not going to even bother trying to live up to his. Okay? Yeah, that was my existence for quite a bit of time. Um, emotional lies about your past. If you grew up in a tribe that was known as ravenous wolves, that guy had some late Friday nights. Let's just kind of leave it at that, okay? I mean, ultimately, we can understand that while we're not given that information, it wouldn't be a too much of a theological jump to say that Saul probably grew up in an environment that was not edifying and honoring of the Lord. His past led in front of him. And then one more. Finally, emotional lies about circumstances. Emotional lies about circumstances. What I mean by this is, if you recall, I mentioned that he, he had already called the people together at Mizpah. Okay? Do you remember what Samuel said? Here's, I'll tell you what he said. I'll write it down so we can see it on the phone. God says this. You have me. I'm all you need. I'll provide for you. It may not be the mansion on the hill, but you will have daily provision. You will have my presence, and I will go with you wherever you go. The armies, nobody will be able to touch you because my spirit will lead you out. You with me? Okay, so God, we have, they have God. And here's what Samuel says because they wanted a king. We don't want God. We want a king. And that king was the name of Saul. How do you think Saul felt about being named king? Saul didn't see himself as God's provision for the nation. Saul, Saul saw himself as God's punishment to the nation. You with me? What would that do for you? God, 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 God. We don't want God. We want a king. Eh, he's not going to do a lot of great stuff for you. Saul, you're it. I mean, I'm not the provision that the nation needs. I'm actually their punishment. I'm sure that was going through his head. But lies about your circumstances can lead you away from the Lord. I was their second choice. I just got lucky. Right time, right place. There are better choices than me. Somebody else can do this better than me. All these things go through our head. And emotional lives will lead you into failure of your destiny. I wrote that down because I didn't want to forget it. So tonight, here's what I want you to talk about. Have you believed lies? Emotional lies. Maybe it's about your physical appearance. I need to look a certain way in order to be respected. If I'm not this way, people aren't going to like me. Whatever it happens to be. Qualifications, maybe your family of origin. That was the one that did it to me, right? You know, I stand before you tonight, a man who does not have a college degree. That was hard for me to say up until just now. <laughs> because... You're supposed to have a college degree in order to be in a position at a mega church like this and leading a huge ministry. I wasn't something that I did. Did I let that limit me? Absolutely, I did. Until so the Lord said, stop prophesying to your disaster and start prophesying to your destiny. No man can stop me from, from going unless you let him. <clears throat> and how do I let? I let myself stop myself, okay? The next one, maybe some lies about your past. Have you, are you living with your past in front of you? The shame, the guilt, the regret, woulda, coulda, shoulda, didn't. That's religion is what that is. That's the spirit of religion. And then the last one there, lies about circumstances. You just got lucky, you know? You really didn't deserve this, if you would. So that's what I want you to talk about tonight. And here's what you're going to do with it in the groups. Um, by the way, I was sitting with the Lord, and this is what he wants to tell you. You're chosen. You're not an accident. You're royalty. My kings and queens. You're unique. I would not change anything about you. And I would give anything to have you as my own, just the way 
Ooh, I love that. That's what the Lord says over us, over you tonight. Talk about this in the groups. Admit the lies you believe. Renounce. Speak out loud. I no longer want to believe that lie. And then confess the truth. I'm chosen. God loves me. And I have a tremendous destiny in my life. Amen? Amen. Let's seal it up. Father, thank you. Um, thank you. Sometimes that's all we need to say. For anyone here tonight that has been bound by their emotions, I pray that you would break that in their spirit right now. I pray that it would be lifted off, and I pray that they would no longer walk in their past, walk by their appearance, walk by any other thing, their qualifications, their circumstances, whatever it happens to be. Lord, no, you instill in them right now the truth. This is who you are, and this is how I've called you. You're my king. You're my queen. And so, God, as we walk out of here tonight, uh, may we be encouraged. May we be encouraged <clears throat> to see things from heaven because that's where we begin to see the real truth of your love for us. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. You're dismissed, guys.